I can say in all honesty and uh, sincerity that, that uh, I can't tell the difference between um, my fiction, uh, my thinking about my fiction and my, my life. Well, we're standing at what for most of my life was the, the furthest horizon or the, the furthest distant place in my mental universe. When I was a small boy visiting my, grand, my father's uh, people in, around Warrnambool, and when I went to the races, there would often be a horse trained, uh, say, at uh, Apsley or Edenhope or Panola in South Australia. They're 20 or 30 k's in that direction or further. And it seemed like a mysterious part of the world to me. I turned my back on the coast for most of my boyhood and looked inland towards the, the old uh, original Western District, the home of the squatters. And even beyond that Western District, there was a mysterious further land, mostly level. And here I am now. It took me the whole of my life to get here. My wife and I on our wedding day, a uh, photograph taken through the rear of the, the wedding car. And here I will be for uh, uh, well, how long? Because uh, nearby is the, the plot of uh, the cemetery plot that uh, my wife and I chose in 2003. Her ashes are uh, in a wooden casket at the top. Mine will be in the middle and uh, my eldest son's hopefully at the foot. And we'll have a, make a nice little uh, trio uh, overlooking this, to use a, 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 a phrase much used in my writing, mostly level grassy countryside with a line of trees in the distance. In fact, there's, there's more than a line of trees here because we're, we're, we're not in the, the territory of the plains so much. We're on the, we're on the margin of the plains, the, uh, the furthest prospect that you could see from the, from, the, from the furthest part of the plains. I may shock or surprise some of my readers if I say that I consider the plains as um, one of my minor works, <laughs> um, not just in length, um, but I am one of the few people who knows, well, I'm the only person who knows the long, true story of how the plains was composed. And um, there was a certain amount of whimsy behind the, the composition of the plains. Um, it came, it was part of a longer book, which was probably the, the nearest I ever came to writing a realistic piece of fiction, a book called The Only Adam. I wrote The Plains, as you, the book that you know as The Plains, by extracting these sections from the unpublished book, The Only Adam, and almost as, um, well, with very little thought that they'd be published at a very uh, difficult time in my writing life when I hadn't been published for five or six years and um, The Only Adam had been rejected by a publisher or two publishers, I think. Um, at a very difficult time, I sat down and thought, I wonder what would happen if, uh, well, he had no name, the, the nameless um, chief character of the plains. I wonder what would happen if he went further into the plains. He's only just started, only just begun his journey. So I just took him further, not in the interest of postmodernism, um, not uh, only as a, a sort of almost a, a speculative enterprise. Uh, you mean the furthest prospect where we stand is the easternmost part of the plains? Uh, or? I'd just say the furthest. I've lost, I, I get a, the plains, north, south, east and west, I never think of them in connection with the plains. The, the real world, the, the visible world, I like to know where north, south, east and west are. And that way, uh, back towards Warrnambool, is due south. But the plains themselves, they, they hover. Uh, they, um, uh, they, they fluctuate. Uh, they're a mental uh, construction. And it's not, it's not appropriate to talk of north-south, but we're, we're somewhere at the outer edges of the plains. Yeah. I'm not talking about the, the essence of reality or whatever, I'm just talking about the plains. They're, they're, they're there, I can see them even now. And uh, the plainsmen, they're, they're, they're a strange breed of people, but they, they don't have any message for, you know, for a philosophical message. They're, it's a literary 
a literary, what's, what's the word, a tour de force, a literary tour de force. And I was as surprised as anyone when the people picked up on it and, um, and wrote the most marvellously um, enthusiastic uh, critiques of the planes. And I have to sort of think, yes, there's probably more in there. I, I'm not mocking myself. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, to pour a bit of cold water on the, uh, the, the solemnity that surrounds that book. Mm. Um, it's, it is a book of, of irony, and, and I'm very pleased that many people have said they found it very funny in places. I mean, pe the plainsmen do things um, all the wrong way around, and they, they look for di look for difficulties, and they, they look for complications where l other people wouldn't find any such thing. With A Million Windows, you've now published three works of fiction since the, uh, the big break of 14 years between uh, Emerald Blue and Barley Patch. And indeed, those three works, especially Barley Patch, can be seen as a response to that, that big break in your writing and, and its um, anxieties and consequences. To what extent would you think of your writing career, therefore, as um, in two parts, before the break and after the break? Well, it's very easy to think of it that way, and uh, uh, you yourself uh, have, a, uh, despite your um, perhaps your wish to be uh, to be modestly dealt with, um, you yourself play a part in that. Now, I addressed a group of young people at Melbourne University a year or two back at the invitation of uh, Anna Hayward. And the first thing I said to them was, my collected works, or my works, were never part, as some people seem to, th seem to get it into their heads that, that, well, never mind other writers, that Gerald Manane, um had in mind almost from the beginning a wonderful step-by-step -step program by which he'd, he'd uh, developed from the author of Tamarisk Grow and uh, A Lifetime on Clouds, Through the Plains, and then he'd go somewhere else, and then he'd go somewhere else, and nothing could be further from the truth. Every one of my books was a compromise between what I would have liked to write. I'm not saying it was an agonising compromise. What I would have liked to write and what I uh, suspected would be um, marketable from a publisher's point of view. Sometimes I had a particular publisher in mind, sometimes not. But I was not free... Uh, until the turn, the turn of the century, I was never free to simply write what I wanted to write. In the early 1990s, I came to realise that Odim Golden Slippers, which was a, going to be a major work of mine, was almost more than I could finish. It was getting out of control. And I suspected or feared that I would have a great deal of trouble getting it published anyway. And so I put it quietly aside with no banging of drums or blowing of trumpets. And I said, I'm going to stop writing for the time being. Now, my wife persuaded me a few years later, and I was quick to take up her suggestion that I should put together Emerald Blue. Uh, and that had trouble finding a publisher. But we, uh, and the publisher took no interest in marketing it or promoting it, and it, it was probably the, all of my books, the one that uh, died the, the, the quickest death. And then uh, Giramondo came into the picture, and with the encouragement of uh, yourself, um, I took a bit of persuading, but I, because I, I just felt that I had written myself the, out, that there wasn't much more to write. I couldn't face going back to finishing Odim Golden Slippers, uh, and Barley Patch um, and uh, A Million Windows and A History of Books uh, were all written safe in the knowledge. Or in, with the sec with, uh, I wrote them with the secure feeling that they would be published because uh, you were so keen, you uh, uh, so uh, encouraged me so much to write them. You didn't tell me what to write, obviously. Um, so those there is a difference. That my earlier books, uh, as interesting and as 
as they are and as proud of them as I am, my earlier books uh, uh, were written under a, with a certain amount of restriction and, and I felt free for the, uh, since the turn of the century to write uh, exactly as I choose to write. Um, and um, Well, I don't know, it's not for me to say what differences there are between the, the both sides of the divide, but I, there obviously are differences. It's just that that break from the evidence of Barley Patch and history of books too must have been quite traumatic. I mean, you, were, you were, weren't that old when you stopped writing fiction so that it would be easy to throw, to, to throw in the towel, so to speak. I, mean, it, I, I felt unhappy. Um, my wife was more unhappy than I. She, she, she uh, um, was, you know, took a bit of, uh, I had to resist a lot of her persuasion. What I did was to, um, was to concentrate, uh, concentrate on my archives. The most, uh, I keep looking out of the sides of my eyes towards them as I speak. Well, this is what I call the, the chronological archive. It starts with this drawer here. Uh, it comprises uh, up till now 24, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24 drawers stuffed full uh, and labelled. Um, with the the coloured labels are uh, meant to highlight items of special interest. The other labels are just labels of dates and subject matter. The drawers of the archives that are most filled with interesting matter are those from the years when I wasn't writing fiction. I, in fact, I mean, I, I wrote, for example, 75,000 words of autobiography, not for publication to, until after the archives are open, but um, all of our very early years, just just as a just as a record, partly, um, and just for the fun of it. And I wrote a hundred thousand words on uh, what I call the uh, providential things uh, or miracles in Hungarian. There's a whole file of of, um, of episode accounts of episodes in my life, which which seem to me to have been almost too too good and too fortunate to have been uh, happened by mere chance. That's a, a, another matter that. Um, perhaps outside what we're talking about, but the archives uh, kept me going. And uh, the thought that I was building up this other body of writing, which I wouldn't see the, the publication of or the, the distribution of, but it, yeah, that kept me going. It starts with uh, um, what I call uh, just family histories. Um, I have a few papers and documents from the 1950s. Uh, it, it really starts to get interesting from the 1960s onward. I didn't feel... Um, deprived uh, in the sense that I, I that I had stuff that I wanted to write about. I've said that before. Um, I thought that, you know, perhaps we'll talk about the well, for example. I thought, all right, I've said the last word on that in Inland. And uh, look, um, little teachers of primary school children and parents of little kids uh, don't need to be told and the world shouldn't need to be told um, in simple human terms what a bit of encouragement will do. I mean, I, first you seem to me to be a nuisance. You say, like, here I am. All I want to do is go to the races and play with my archives and this guy in Sydney wants me to keep writing. Um, and, but being a fairly polite person and willing, you know, willing to oblige, I did uh, write those essays, um, The Angel's Son and the, the Breathing Author, and they went into the book Invisible Yet Enduring Lilacs. And then I thought, all right, I'll, I'll give him a work of fiction and that's, that's where we began the, 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 uh, the barley patch and what followed. The, the best years were the 1990s. Um, when I'd stopped writing fiction. What have we got here? Uh, a letter of 8,000 words to Julian Lee. Um, here's one. Um, I dream a prophetic dream. I can't remember what the prophetic dream was, but, but it's there in the archives. Um, in Barley Patch, I think it is, you describe a dream that Turgenev had, uh, that his characters appeared to him and uh, uh, asked to, be en to enter into his world. Uh, and uh, the writer of the narrator of Barley Patch says, um, actually, it should have been the other way round. He imagines it the other way round that the characters were calling Turgenev into their world. Well, I hope there's a look of slight amazement on my face because you have just mentioned uh, an episode, or you've brought to my mind an episode in the writing of Barley Patch, um, which was crucial. Now, there's a there's a, a file in my archives. Um, my struggle to write Barley Patch. Now, what did we talk about before, the, the, uh, the latest one? A Million Windows was the easiest book to write. Barley Patch was, was almost impossible. I can remember a Sunday 
when I had an appointment, I was to go to the, they had, the Hungarian group had a cultural afternoon. They would show Hungarian films and Hungarian music, and I used to go occasionally. And I couldn't go that day because I'd sat literally all morning. The, 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 the cultural thing was in the afternoon. It was only five miles away, five kilometres away. I'd sat all morning, paralysed almost, not being able to go on with Barley Patch. I didn't have, I had rough plans of it, and the Turgenev thing, I kept thinking of it, and that's when I turned it round. Um, and, and from that moment on, I, I, got, I got through. I, it took me all one Sunday to, to come up with that simple notion of, yes, the, the characters, instead of saying, uh, you know, write about us, we have no existence worth living unless you write about us, they were saying, go away, old man, <laughs> leave us to our, we've got a much better place in here, we're much better off here than we are out in the world of books. And that, that, that's... That sums it up. I mean, that, to me, that, that asks all these questions. Where is the world of books? Where were these people before he got to know them? Why did they come to him in dreams? Wouldn't, couldn't they come any other way? All these wonderful questions. And yeah, I'll never think, oh, that was one of the most miserable days of my writing life until that moment sometime in the late afternoon. And I felt bad not going to this other thing, um, the Hungarian gathering, and here I was, the, the, it finally worked, the Turgenev thing. Writing is, um, it's good to be reminded, I must have sounded a bit earlier on as though writing is you know, something that I've done easily and smoothly, but there have been some horrible times. Um, I almost felt like giving up the, going, going back and cutting it into a shorter piece and just putting it together with other short pieces, but then I knew I could go on. This is a draw given over to my learning the Hungarian language. Uh, the drawer is filled, packed from back to front with these little bags. I think there's about 30 of them. Each bag has handfuls of tickets. I think altogether there are 30,000 tickets um, in the drawer and each of them in my own handwriting has on one side um, a word or a sentence or a, uh, sometimes two or three sentences in Hungarian. Where's a suitable... Uh, in English on black. Um, black he goes on with his work. He goes on with his journey. Green, foytotja a munka yard, foytotja a zut yard. I used to sit down at the desk, and I still do it occasionally for a vision, test myself uh, trying to guess the Hungarian version uh, while looking at the English version. And the whole drawer, as I said, is, is filled. You mentioned the well and um, that image of the... Um the girl who drowns herself in the well, who leaps into the well, the peasant girl, uh, which um, you take originally from the Birds of the Pushta, uh, but which appears in a number of works, most notably, I think, in Inland, but it's also in A Million Windows as well. Yeah. And then when, um, it's, when it leads to the clearing in the forest and uh, um, the rape of the mother, suddenly you feel there's an aspect to that image which in some ways explains its recurrence but it hadn't been there until then. Well, fiction is a kind of magic or alchemy. Um, I was sitting on a suburban train. I can't recall. Somewhere in those archives over there uh, would be the answer to that, but never mind. It was a date somewhere in the 80s, and I was reading an English translation of the Hungarian. It's not a novel. It's a, a book of sociology, I suppose, Pustak Nepe which means People of the Pusta, was written in the 1930s. And I read a, a section about the oppression, the sexual oppression of the girls on the great estates, by the, not by the owners and the aristocrats who owned the estates, but by the lesser officials who only jumped up peasants anyway, the overseers and the farm supervisors. <clears throat> and then I read the uh, pages that the cowherds pulled her out when they watered the cattle at dawn. And uh, I think my life changed at that point and uh, something, I knew something was afoot um, and I, I couldn't have imagined uh, the way that that piece of reading would change my life and my fiction. And, um, and of all the images that I have in mind, that one probably yield, has yielded the most and has perhaps even still the most to yield and it caused me to learn the Hungarian language for one thing and to be able to quote <clears throat> the whole of that passage in Hungarian that's 
that's the cow herds pulled her out when they watered the cattle at dawn section. And uh, I wrote the book Inland and uh, the well just keeps occurring and uh, I don't go looking for it, it comes looking for me. And it occurs in numerous places as you've said in, in the other books and, and things that I've written. And being a, an obsessive recorder of things, on top of these bags I've put a little folder, uh, 3,000 words, just um, explaining why I learnt the Hungarian language, how I learnt it, and listing all the, the books I've read in Hungarian, all the songs and poems that I can sing in Hungarian, and uh, yeah, a, a Hungarian draw. I can't imagine uh, anything more shallow or unsatisfying than the cult of, of realism in fiction that all one wants to do is to write about surfaces and words that people say, the looks on their faces, the clothes they're wearing. Um, when I think of the word fiction, I, I think of uh, someone at a desk grappling with what are largely unseen, what I call the invisible world or the world of the mind. Um, fiction starts and, and for me never gets away uh, from the, the realm of the mind. That, and even when I read, uh, I can never forget that what I'm reading is the product of a human hand and that behind what I'm reading is a human voice and I hear that voice in the, in the sentences and phrases I read and being a human, a curious human being, I visualise the, if I haven't seen a photograph of the author, I visualise the, the possessor of that voice and I erred then when I said author, I should say implied author because we're not, we, uh, as you would know from your reading of A Million Windows, we can't hope to learn anything of the breathing author uh, or very little of the breathing author from what we know about the implied author. Um, I don't uh, like to show much of the Antipodean archive, but I'm prepared to say that the Antipodes is a fictional place um, in a, an alternative universe where Australia and New Zealand don't exist. Um, and the Antipodes consists of two uh, independent uh, dominions in the British Commonwealth. One's called New Eden. Uh, they're island states. They're a little bit shaped a bit like New Zealand or Tasmania. Um, and the, the, the people there are uh, uh, devoted to horse racing. There are more race courses per person in the Antipodes than there are in New Zealand. You were studying for the priesthood at, at one point. Oh, and, a, uh, a very short time. Short time. But the image of the, the large house with many rooms and many windows in each of which there is a, a, a dedicated writer harks back to that. And critics have, have said, I think, about your writing and I believe this too, that there's a kind of displacement from Catholic belief into a, into a, a kind of belief in the power of fiction to probe uh, the limits of, um, of the mind or, or of experience uh, to, uh, you know, summon up uh, feelings or, or resonances that aren't otherwise available to. The idea of monasteries and, and, and uh, men living apart from the world or uh, even hermits living in isolated uh, um, places with a uh, uh, looking down on the world from from mountain sides or um, withdrawing from the world uh, has always appealed to me. It, it, not just the, the the Catholic ideal, but um, if I were reading as a as an impressionable teenager that uh, he was virtually a recluse in his later years, I thought, oh wow. This guy's for me. Wow. <laughs> uh, um, or in, in Hungarian literature, there's because Hungarians were, were, have a tradition of their, their writing is much more political than I'd, I'd ever care to. Uh, or their writers are much more political than I'd ever care to be. They were always uh, being oppressed and struggling against oppression and oppression. And it was a common, fairly common. Uh, the, the poet Verismati was one example, but there are others. Uh, so disappointed was he uh, in his later years that he retired to his estates. So it's not just that the Catholic priest sort of praying alone in his room or uh, in the chapel, but it's, it's, it's the literary man who, who goes away to the country and uh, tires of the, the struggle and the, the, uh, the noise and the, the frustration of the city. But you don't, um, you don't see uh, sheep on the plains. The plains don't have anything on them really, do they? I use the expression latifundi, I don't know why, the Spanish expression. They're immensely wealthy, but no, you, 
<laughs> no visible They don't dirty their <laughs> hands. They don't dirty their hands uh, uh, with wealth making. <clears throat> uh, wonderfully free to, to, uh, to paint their, um, their, what are you called, coats of arms and design their racing colours. Here are some of the uh, new Arcadian uh, racehorse trainers. Um, there are lists of their names and colours. There's quite a few of them. Uh, yeah, uh, Ms. L.T. White's colours are white, purple striped sleeves and yellow cap. R.T. Barnes, lilac, maroon sash, black corded cap. Ms. W.E. Robinson, uh, she trains at Saggers, which is in the Clear District. To speak of something that our listeners uh, won't know about at the moment, the book Border Districts. Um, you have in your possession a, a, a shortish, I think it's 40,000 words. Uh, um, uh, I'll call it a typescript since I used, typed it up on my old machine. A typescript called Border Districts. And in the implication of, one of the implications of Border Districts is that um, imaginative literature comes from the same source as religious devotion, that uh, the narrator claims that um, he still possesses all the imagery that he possessed when he was a believing Catholic, and images of God and of uh, angels and saints and holy places and chapels and so on, um, and he uh, gets to know of later, he never meets her, but he gets to know of uh, later in the book a female personage who's um, a uh, strange woman, uh, uh, she's entirely fictitious by the way, I've never, some of my, not all of the people in my fiction are drawn from, from anything called real life. Uh, this is, uh, well, she's 95% fictitious. She wants to know where creative material comes from. She's embarked on this search. She wants to set up a community in a, a lonely part of South Australia or the place across the border and and there's a, a coming together of two sets of imagery and a, a hint that the true source of, of what she's looking for might be in the minds of people uh, who um, were once devoted to some supernatural uh, existence or supernatural doctrine uh, and are no longer so or have always yearned for such a thing. So there's a, yeah, there is a, a clear connection in my mind between um, going away, turning away from, I turned to my desk when I said that, sitting down over your desk with your back to the world, uh, writing, and the priest at the altar, <coughs> with his, as they used to in the old days, with his back to the world, uh, trying to get into closer contact with God. The calendar is something I'm very proud of. When I broke my leg in 1994, I had to spend six weeks uh, lying down, or, well, six weeks in plaster. A lot of it was lying down. And I think, um, I think without exaggeration, that the creation of this took as much uh, time and, and um, took as much, made as many demands on me as almost a, 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 a 20,000 word work of fiction. Every one of these uh, races has to fit into a kind of pattern. You don't, uh, racing people know what I'm talking about. You don't have a, a big cup race uh, followed by a steeplechase. There's a, there's a season of the year for jumps races, a season of the year for the big cups races and the and the season of the year for the early two-year-old races. And here they all are. I, it, it took me weeks and weeks of planning. That's for New uh, Eden. New Arcady has, a, has every single race. The New Eden races are only the major races. On the day, on the Thursday, the 6th of April, um, the Prospect Hill Trial is run at Washdyke. Uh, that's not a big race, but here's the Deepwater Cup. The 10 furlongs, $75,000 on the 22nd of April. They're only the major races. Over in New Arcady, every race, it's a smaller place, um, they only have about uh, 180, 180 meetings a year. And that's every race ever run in New Arcady. The distances, the stake money, um, the names, the sort of eligibility of horses. I'm also referring to you know, that movement in your, um, in your writing at the furthermost reach of the fictional world to imagine a world beyond that world or within that world. Well, um, just, to, just to lighten the subject a bit, I think at the furthermost reaches of my world, uh, there are race courses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
But uh, those race courses open up to... Well, they're semi, semi-divine. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're almost on a level with the divine. In, in what sense, though? Yeah. Well, because they, 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 I derive from the contemplation of those race courses the same sort of exalted um, feelings that I derive from the, what I thought was the contemplation of, of the image of, the, of, of, the, of God himself or itself. When I, a horse enters, comes into existence, you might say, um, by a selection of random numbers, I find out which letter of the alphabet its name will start. There are 76 uh, l- numbers. Suppose the number, choose a random number between 1 and 76. 36. 36. Well, that means the horse's name will start with L. And um, we look up the page with names with L. Uh, here are some of the names that, might, that are still, some have been used. Uh, Lully, Lorca, Lead Light, Last Exit, Leave Me Out, Learn the Ropes, Ledger Domain, Last Trump, Lexicon, Lamb Based, Lap of the Gods. I like uh, concrete, evocative names. I don't like names like Good Boy or Lucky Lad or something like that. <laughs> Little Brown Jug, Lime Spider, Leech Gatherer, Lowell. There are literary allusions and things there. Well, Lip Service, Lock Linney, Lady Smock, Limburger, Lost Her Slipper, Lone Piper. And there were also names, Liquid Fire was the name of a racehorse that raced in Melbourne in the 1950s. They're, the name is a preserve. My memories of, of horse racing imagery from my childhood, the, the pictures in the sporting papers, uh, the, the colours that my father used for his old useless racehorse, Zimmy, that he trained in the backyard for one year in Bendigo, those things uh, um, have stayed in my mind, and they, even at the time, they were at least as inspiring as my visits to the Sacred Heart Cathedral in Bendigo or the, uh, the St Killian's Catholic Church. Race, race, I never thought of it at the time and I would have been embarrassed if, 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 to, to have to confess it, but I think racing has always been a, a, a about as important to me, uh, always was in the early days as important to me as, as religion, a form of religion. Burnborough uh, and I were meant for each other. I know that sounds corny. Uh, Burnborough was born few months before I was born. He was born up in the, the Darling Downs near Toowoomba. He died at Spendthrift Farm in Kentucky. He was a famous, a successful sire in America. He died in the year I was married. And the very first year that I was um, developing my interest in racing, uh, Burnborough um, became famous. I'd defend myself against um, being labelled a, a writer of self-referential fiction. I know that it's a fine line I'm drawing, but um, uh, it just seems to me that, 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 my, that my fiction, uh, and this sounds a little bit like a boast, my fiction has almost an extra dimension to it, um, and, and that consists of the mutual awareness by both implied author and reader or implied reader, that this is just more than a description of something that once happened or might have happened. This is a description of the effect on the mind of whatever happened or might have happened. Why he was my hero, I still believe he's the, the greatest horse ever bred in Australia, as great as Farlap, <coughs> um, possibly even Carbine, and they were bred in New Zealand, so Burnborough easily takes the prize for the best bred or the best Australian bred horse. Burnborough's peculiarity was that he liked to, to drop back in his races and come with an extraordinary finishing run at the end. And this, this greatly excited me as a boy uh, to think that this, I have a photo of him uh, in a big race in Brisbane, um, at last into the straight, about 30 metres behind the leading horse. And then within 150 metres, he'd come from last and, and drawn clear of the field. So uh, yeah, my equine hero, Burnborough. His colours, orange, purple sleeves, black cap. <clears throat> There's uh, a motif that you come back to in a number of works of uh, looking at religious calendars, uh, calendars which feature the saints or cards that have saints on them. And the, the narrator argues that it's an inferior kind of uh, contemplation just to look at the figure, uh, that what you need to do is to look at the landscape behind the figure which then provides a prompt for other kinds of imagining. And it's very similar to the sort of process you describe in reading books, that uh, the, the reader imagines themselves into the book as a character, 
accompanying the other characters in the book. Well, I'm, uh, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up because it's um, an important part of my thinking that I hadn't, we hadn't mentioned up till now. Um, I that might sound like a simpleton or a, um, a child when I confess that it's always been of great interest to me the, the topography of our minds, that when I sit reading a book, um, I'm vaguely aware of my surroundings. In fact, sometimes crucially aware. There are, there are books I recall my first reading of, um, and as soon as I recall that first reading, I recall the tree I was sitting under, or the, the room I was sitting in, or the person who was asleep in the nearby bed, or whatever. Um, so I'm aware of my surroundings. Um, I'm aware of or, sort of um, the contents of the book, but that's too simple a statement. I'm curious to know where I locate the events in the book, because when I'm reading a, a person, say, in a Thomas Hardy novel, crossing a landscape, you know, I, I can stop, and I have stopped, even as a, as a, as a I might say, an ignorant child. You know, where is this place? Where... where all right, you call it the mind, but where is it? And in what part of the mind? Is it a near part of the mind? Uh, and if if in the landscape, if, if in the Thomas Hardy landscape there was a hill, what lies beyond the hill? And is it possible to see beyond the hill, even though it's not mentioned in the text? And curious, uh, strange, complicated questions can arise. And uh, um, yeah, uh, only of late years have I ever put them in put them into, incorporated them or used them in, in, in my writing. See it as part of that vast enterprise that I described before of uh, a, a kind of, a, a, not so much, a, a vast place in which I've almost lost my way. And parts of that place are what I've written in my books, parts of what I've written in the archives, parts of what I've read, parts of what I imagine, parts are in the, the racing uh, antipodes, uh, antipodean archive. Um, I'm just surrounded by mental places. just occurred to me then that somewhere in, not far from, you know, behind your back in one of those drawers, there's a file with a label. I have coloured labels for things that I think are rather important. And the heading on that file says, I am a very strange fellow. The grass is actually longer than this, isn't it? It's not no, well, cropped grass, down. The grass is uh, a bit like that grass on the cover of um, a million windows. That yeah. that was a good choice. That it's, it's got to be suitable for grass, the ground dwelling birds. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Are there ground dwelling birds here? Uh, if I could invite, if I could somehow summon them up, uh, my sacred bird is the plover. I used to have as my emblem um, a little bird called the plains wanderer, Pedianomus torquatus in Latin, but there aren't any left, in, or hardly any left in Victoria, They're way up in the northern plains, or even in the Riverina, um, and it's not, uh, it's not, it's a, a cheerless kind of thing uh, to have a sacred emblem, for, a bird for a sacred emblem, never to see it in the, in, 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 in the lie, in a living specimen. So I switched to having plover for my. They call, you're supposed to call them lapwings now. I still call them plovers, and there's a family of them around this cemetery. And I often see them here of a Sunday morning when I come up to tidy this uh, headstone. Um, but I think the wind's got to them at the moment. We won't see them. But they call out to me and I give them a wave in return. 